Hi everyone, it's Ken here. In part three of this series, we're going to begin machining the many parts that make up the hand. And because there are so many parts, we're going to break this down into various steps. So, let's get started. If you're like me, when you're drawing a part in CAD, half of your brain is concentrating on getting the part right, while the other half is jumping ahead and thinking about how you're actually going to machine the part. And as I drew these parts, which are actually representations of the tiny little bones that make up your fingers, it was obvious that most of these parts had to be machined from at least four sides and sometimes even five and six sides. And because they're so tiny, the question becomes how on earth are you going to fixture them? How are you going to hold them in a vise or fixture or, or however you decide to do it? And then some of the parts have center sections which are best done on a lathe. Naturally, when you're looking at a part which is predominantly square or rectangular, you're thinking about using rectangular stock. But in actuality, there's no requirement to do that. And because some of these parts have operations that need to be done on the lathe, it finally occurred to me that if I just started with cylindrical stock and used my fourth axis, that that would be the best approach to take. This approach let me quickly hog away the material I wasn't going to need. And then the beauty of the fourth axis is that I can access four different sides of the part without having to refixture it. The end mills I'm using are from Lakeshore Carbide and are specifically made for machining aluminum. These end mills are capable of some pretty aggressive material removal rates, but I found that I had to back off on them because of the way the material is being fixtured. There's a general rule of thumb that says that an unsupported piece of stock shouldn't stick out more than three times the diameter of the stock. Although when I begin cutting this piece, I'm within those parameters. As I continue to remove stock, the diameter of the piece obviously reduces very rapidly. And what I found as I was making my prototype is that the stock was deflecting, noticeably in fact, and the end result was that I was not holding the dimensions and tolerances that I had programmed the part for. So all I had to do was back off on the feeds and speeds, and everything went fine. I do have a tailstock that I could use to support the end of the piece, but it's fairly large and it wouldn't fit in that space that I have between the fourth axis and the vise. And since I'm going to be using the vise extensively in this project, I didn't want to keep removing it and replacing it. But even with the compromises I chose to make, you can see that I'm getting some pretty decent material removal rates and forming some nice chips. If we stop and take a look, you can see the finish that the bottom of an end mill leaves on a part. And if you've never handled a part like this, you'd be surprised to find out that it feels perfectly smooth to the touch. So why does an end mill leave a pattern like this? Well, you might think that the bottom of an end mill is flat, but in actuality, it isn't. It's actually somewhat concave. And the reason for that is a flat-bottomed end mill wouldn't be able to do any cutting. You need to form an edge on the bottom of the end mill in order for it to cut the bottom surface. So what ends up happening is the outermost edges of the end mill leave a pattern behind. And in fact, the pattern that they're leaving is forensic evidence of the tool path that you used to finish the bottom of the part. Some people remove it with sandpaper or Scotch-Brite. Some people use a sandblaster. Other people tumble the parts. But the bottom line is, no matter what technique you use, it is difficult to remove this. So what I've done to make my life simpler is I've left a few thousands behind, and then I followed it up with a parallel pass, where the end mill is always moving in the same direction, and I do a step over of 20 thousandths of an inch on each pass. That leaves me with a finish that looks like this. This finish is actually rather easy to remove 
with sandpaper. And I'll go into the details as to how I do that in a later video. After machining the four sides of the metacarpal four times for each of the four fingers, I head on over to the bandsaw to cut off the waste material. Then it's back to the mill into the vise, where I machine the fifth side of the metacarpal. Then I flip it in the vise and finally machine the sixth side. This one part required 41 separate cam operations to machine it. Each of the four fingers has both a medial and a proximal. And if you take a look at the two, you can see that they're very similar. The thing is that they are actually different on every finger because every finger is a different length, and these are the two parts that determine the length. We're going to machine the medial next. But the machining for all of these uh, parts is basically the same. Taking a closer look, it's clear that this section needs to be milled, and this section needs to be milled. But we'll be working on this section on a lathe. So let's head down to the shop and make ourselves a medial. Machining the medial is in many ways very similar to machining the metacarpal. I begin by hogging away the material I'm not going to need. And then I drill the necessary holes just to get that step out of the way. Next I use an adaptive pattern to remove the majority of the material on one end of the part. And when that's all complete, I go back to that parallel strategy I pointed out in the last part, which cleans up the pattern that the bottom of the end mill leaves on the surface. Then I contour the curve at the end of the part. The difference with this part is because of its shape, I can use the side of the end mill to clean up areas. The side of the end mill is capable of leaving a beautiful finish, unlike the bottom of the end mill. So any time I can do this, I certainly will. It's just that the first part we made, the shape just didn't allow fitting an end mill in there to clean up those areas. And the last step in this op is to cut that tiny slot that allows the cable to pass through. Next, it's over to the lathe to machine the cylindrical section in the middle of the part. Here you can see one of the other advantages of beginning with cylindrical stock. If I had used rectangular stock, right now I'd be fiddling with a four-jaw chuck trying to get the part centered. But by using cylindrical stock, I can just slide it into a 5C collet and get right to work. Now because the part has been machined and it's no longer cylindrical, we're going to have interrupted cuts as I begin to do the grooving operation. Because of the interrupted cut, it took quite a bit of experimenting with the toolpath to get this right. 
It turned out that by choosing a tool path which begins in the center of the cylinder and working its way out to both sides, that gave me the best results. And once that's complete, we part off the piece and now we go back to the mill. Work holding for the final operation proved to be the most difficult. And after trying lots and lots of different techniques, I finally went uh, a bit overboard and created a custom fixture to do it. But once the part is mounted in the fixture, the machining is pretty straightforward. I begin with an adaptive strategy to clear out the majority of the material. Then I go to that parallel strategy to remove the machining marks. And finally, I do a contour to give us that final radius at the end of the part. And now it's done. The last part I'll be making in this video is the distal, which of course is the fingertip. This is one of the few parts in the entire hand that is actually the same for all four fingers. And if you haven't already figured it out, I have to do separate CAD and CAM for all of the other parts, because although they're similar, they are different which is why this project is so complicated. If we take a closer look at the distal, you can see that this part needs to be turned on the lathe, and I'm going to do that first. Then we'll head back to the mill and finish up the rest of it, which includes this section back here, and all of these operations through here. So, back to the shop. Over at the lathe, the first thing you have to do is find Z0. And although there are a zillion ways to do this, I've used an electronic edge finder as my master tool. And as soon as the uh, red light comes on, I know I'm at Z0. Next, I face off the part. And then I switch to a different tool to cut the profile. I don't know about you, but I still find it mesmerizing to watch a lathe do its CNC magic. Next, I move the part back over to the mill and put it in the fourth axis. The first step, as you've seen before, is to hog away the bulk of the material. And then I switch over to an adaptive pattern to begin cutting the major features of the part. Once that's done, I switch back to that parallel strategy to remove the tooling marks. Then I flip the part over and perform the same operations on the flip side. 
Next I come in and do a decorative contour. And then I begin spotting for the many drilling operations that have to occur here. You have to be very careful when you're drilling on the edge of a cylinder. And if you notice, I spotted this particular hole from the top and the bottom. Because you have to spot rather deeply to drill on the edge of a cylinder, I did that from both sides so that the finished part would look uniform. And the last step is to cut out that slot where the cable passes through. Once that's done, I remove the waste stock from the part because the next operation is to cut that rounded profile at the end of the part. I'm mounting the part in a 5C collet here, and the problem here is there's very little to grip. I use an adjustable parallel to make sure that the part is flat relative to the machine table. And then I do a sanity check to make sure that the end mill will fit in there because you don't want to be cutting into the 5C collet. And don't ask me how I know that. Once that's done, I mount the collet and part in the vise. And I take some very conservative cuts here because there's so little work holding going on. Then I switch to a tiny end mill to round off those two corners. And the part is done. If you like this video and would like to be notified when I release new videos in this series or in other projects, all you need to do is click subscribe. If you're interested in my other projects, you can find them at my website at www.zeman.com or you can scan my channel here at Cantoons. I'll be back.